Hey everyone, welcome to Dirk Island. I'm Michael Durkheimer. I'm Alec Durkheimer. And this is the weekend show where we talk about documentaries. This week we are talking about the Netflix documentary called Knock Down the House, which is mostly about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's uh, pretty impressive victory over this longtime fourth most powerful Democrat in the House primary in New York. But it also profiles three other women who were going for uh, Congress in the same year and I had no idea this was being filmed I just found out about it a few weeks ago and it came out and uh, you know I think it was a pretty interesting watch so hope you enjoy so what were your initial impressions of knock down the house I thought it was interesting to kind of peer into what it entails to challenge an establishment candidate you know, quite candidly, I don't pay a, a tremendous amount of detail to congressional races, particularly in other states. Mm -hmm. um, so this was an interesting kind of shows you the different barriers to entry for someone new, what that takes, and then also how some of these candidates, uh, it, it is particularly in Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's context, had gone unchallenged for you know 15 years. There are candidates who have just been the pick for Congress. For, mm -hmm. for over a decade. So it was really interesting to kind of learn about what the status quo is in some of these congressional positions and, and what it what you have to do to be a new entry into this this uh, level of politics. Yeah, I I gotta say I I didn't know if I would think this was all that good. I you know, knowing about her victory in context of the whole thing, like she came out like a lightning rod. I didn't know who she was until she had already won this. So I didn't even know her the, and her name until the movie's basically over. Because this only covers the period of the primary, essentially. Um, before she be basically became a national figure, even though she kind of was, it seems like, before that. But I was so fascinated by this. I really was liked it so much more than I expected. I couldn't I I have only seen her in the national context. I have only seen the ads where she's actually being challenged on policy issues. And although it's super important and not everything she's said in public, I think is like really well done. Mm -hmm. Uh I thought she came off so it was just like so impressive so impressive as a person and that's what a documentary can do I mean it can bring you kind of behind and obviously you can create whatever narrative you really want but I was like just in awe of what what was going on and then by the end of it I was actually like I felt like good about the country in a way and I don't I again I don't even share all of her or maybe even a lot of her like particular interests she has policy positions on a lot of things that I just you know don't really have an opinion one way or the other on mm -hmm. but in spite of that is all about character and confidence and that was so impressive in this context so a question we always like to ask about documentaries we're watching is why do they matter? You know, what is their, what is its reason for being? Yeah, so I, I would say for this one, I, you know, I think it's almost like a bit of a, like a Mr. Smith goes to Washington in a freaking documentary, a true story. You know, I remember seeing the, um, the Obama speech at the 2004 convention uh, where he came on and he was doing it was kind of you know people in retrospect said it was a bit of a rip off of what John Edwards was doing before but it was like something like you know there is not the this America and that America there's only the United States of America there's it's such a famous incredible speech and the guy basically became president off of that freaking wave of momentum and I you know I just learning about a, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from the media world that we live in, I feel like didn't, has never, I've never actually, you know, she's just a rep from New York, you know, she really doesn't have that much power, although she gets so much news and so much media, so she really does have a lot more power than mm -hmm. the average representative. But it was really interesting because 
This story matters a lot because of some of the messages that she says and the messages that come through. You know, one of the, the interesting things about this is that she's the only one that wins. There are actually four women who are profiled. You know, if you're a documentarian making this, I'm not sure how they collect the, the footage, but it seems like you could have had zero out of four, or you could have had four out of four. And in reality, they had one out of four. They had one Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and they had three other women who were profiled who did not beat the incumbent. And it really, it's almost too perfect, you know, because there's a moment where she's consoling someone who had their primary a few weeks earlier, and she said, you know, for a hundred of us have to try for even one of us to get through, and that's just the reality we face. I, that is, it's so perfect. It is so, such a good message, and it, in this case, was true. And it is, it is interesting because a lot of things seem to be like that. And I, the other thing that was really interesting to me about this documentary is watching her confidence. Because, so there are a few theories of the world, and we've talked about this with kind of the, the idea of fake it till you make it. And like, fake it till you make it's okay when you're talking about confidence, perhaps, or self-esteem. But it's not okay when you're talking about a physical product or whatever, right? But... I often wonder with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or anyone if it really is that you're like faking it till you make it because the interesting thing that I get from seeing her especially watching her like fucking attack in certain moments of like the debate when you see her going against Crowley or when he doesn't show up who's this guy Joe Crowley is her opponent when he doesn't show up to a debate and someone's there she's like with all due respect with all due respect and then just fucking like basically mic drops on like line after line people are like what do you think about the Iraq war and it's like well blah, 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 blah. it's and she's just like the Iraq war was a mistake and we should have never done that and anyone who voted for it is an idiot you know and it's like okay whatever like okay maybe the actual answer is more nuanced than that but she is fucking an absurdly good like political media like savvy person so I often wonder with this idea like it, it Akazia, she is not faking it until she made it. She might have not made it, but she wasn't faking it. That's the thing. She has so much skill, and I have no idea where it comes from. It's like so evident that she has so much skill, and so her confidence is incredible. She's she's kind of psyching herself up before an, an, a, um, a debate with Joe Crowley, and she says a number of mantras to herself, basically, like, you have the maturity to do this. You are smart enough to do this. You're old enough to do this. You're wise enough to do this. You, um, you know, it just like five or six different things, you know, and he's going to try to tell you that like, you know, uh, thanks for your efforts, but you're not that you're not that you're not that, you know, I'm the only one who knows how to deal with Washington. I'm number four. I'm like, could be speaker of the house, whatever, like just put her down. Cause she is like a 28 year old bartender basically by the time we, you know, see her in the beginning of the thing. But honestly, like, when she's saying those mantras to herself, it's as if it's not empty. It's it's true. It's true. Like, of course, you could say that she doesn't know. Maybe she doesn't really know enough about policy. But, like, we really, for people in the House of Representatives, so many of them are pretty I just – is no news to anybody, but they don't see a lot of them don't seem all that smart. So it's not like she's like, even if she's 28 and doesn't know everything about foreign relations or economics, it's very difficult to know all of the things that it takes to like make national level decisions. I mean, it's so much information. So like, uh, you know, there's a learning curve, but re in reality, compared to the guy, compared to the other guy, she did have all those things. So she's not sitting there in a way like pumping herself up full of hot air it felt like she like legitimately has some serious skills and i just was in awe of seeing that and seeing someone who didn't actually have any power yet like have that confidence and it's it's an interesting thing because i think that when someone you know there's a saying a related saying if you think you can or you think you can't you're right you know, and it's like, or wh whether you think you can, and it's like, if you think you can, that's what you need to be able to do it. And if you think you can't, that, that means you can't. Now, people assume 
that it's that what that sentence means is that if you think you can, that belief is what propels you forward. Maybe it's true. Maybe that's true. If you think you can't, that belief is what holds you back. But I think it's interesting watching someone like that because she thought she could, but then again, she could. And she the, she tells a story about you know the 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 other Democratic insiders in the um in the thing like they think they've got this in the bag but they don't know the de demographics of my area all these people think it's not but they have their head in the sands and I feel oftentimes like people who actually come out of nowhere or deliver with this sense of confidence actually do know things that most other people don't know it actually comes from a position of knowledge the do you think you can or do you think you can't she thought she could and I think she actually had knowledge like a rare knowledge of like like what the dynamics were, and also what skills she had that you can't just see by looking at her. You know, I, I, I was just, I just thought, you know, the, the combination of a knowledge of the electorate that people were undervaluing, and afterwards everyone's like, well, it's a majority minority district. I mean, of course, it's not that impressive that she won. It's like, well, before she won, people didn't think she could freaking win, no matter what. So how is that not that impressive, you know? And it's be, and also like whether or not a 28 year old bartender can freaking beat a guy in a debate and can answer questions intelligently. For me, you're gonna if you're on Twitter, if you're paying attention to politics at all, I'm I've heard of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, or as she now goes as AOC, and this freshman class of congressmen all the time, um, or congresswomen rather. And it was interesting learning about Justice Democrats, who they cover a little bit in this documentary, who I was pretty ignorant as to what they were. I, I did a quick Google search, wikipedia them. They're actually this group that a lot of the Bernie leadership from 2016 helped f uh, start, along with Cenk uh, Junger and... Uh, What's his name? Kyle Kalinsky, who does Secular Talk and the Young Turks. Like mm -hmm. some who are, they're no longer involved, but and and then some Bernie leadership. And the main driver behind Justice Democrats is finding grassroots candidates. And you see these four that they cover in the doc. Um, their whole goal is to challenge establishment Democrats and get candidates who basically get the money out of politics, which Bernie in the 2016 presidential election became a huge issue. So these are all candidates who aren't taking the big donations. And Crowley, her competitor, was one of those guys who had the big money donations where it's AOC and all the Justice Democrat-backed people, they're, much, they're grassroots. They get their donations and their support by going through the community and collecting the numbers, you know, which is, which is great to know. It's good to understand what this movement of fresh blood, what kind of their impetus is, will make you, for me at least, regardless, because I'm the same way. I learn about AOC from... Democrats and Republicans both like, you know, attacking each other and talking, you know, Republicans love to talk about how dumb she is and how ill-advised her Green New Deal or whatever she's proposing. So it was kind of helpful to know, actually, the movement behind these people is wanting to get money out of politics, which I think is something everyone wants. And it just was good. I didn't really have a concept where, you know, AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, you hear about these congresswomen a lot because they're diverse, they're fresh blood, they're part of the class that, so fresh, um, they're part of, I, I think, believe there's the most women in Congress ever right now in this new class, so they're part of this new wave. Uh, so that was why this matters, because you're going to be hearing about these people a lot, and this documentary kind of shows you uh, who they are and this Justice Democrats organization that is trying to do what you were talking about, AOC was talking about, which is throw those hundred candidates uh, into the races, and maybe they only get, you know, 3% of them through the door, but they got some people through the door. They had some major success in the 2018 midterms, and all these candidates you're going to see. And uh, it's kind of, I mean, not to compare, characterize them the same, but it is kind of like the Democratic Tea Party. It's like, for, for all those people when Obama was in office and they just 
were losing their minds and had to make a reaction. The same people, you know, all of us, a lot of sane people are losing their minds because Trump's in office. And this is kind of, I think, part of the shows that wave of reaction. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's why it matters. I yeah. think it's good to kind of understand where these people are coming from. Okay. So on knock down the house. What were your fa Do you have any favorite moments? Most impactful? Definitely in the debate when uh, AOC is going up against her opponent, Joe Crowley. The, it was so striking to see his overconfidence. I mean, it is, I think, the most impactful moment of the entire documentary. You see AOC, super young, clearly connected, feels like of the people. And then Joe Crowley, for lack of a better word, is kind of just the crusty old white guy. And he's so condescending. And it's interesting. He... As they're debating, he's not winning the current debate that they're in. He's doing a lot worse than her. And then he wraps up, he does this really disconnected uh, kind of wrap up at the end of the uh, the end of the debate where he says, you know, I just want to thank you for all the passion you've brought to this race. And uh, basically in the way of thanks for, thanks for bringing some passion to the politics and I hope it, he literally says, I hope it doesn't end on Tuesday. As if, you know, it's great that you did it just for the point um, and, you know, when I inevitably win in a couple of days, I hope that you're still involved with politics. It could not be more condescending and it's all the more crazy that He's saying this in a debate that he's currently losing and in a race that he's about to lose. So to just see someone who ends up losing a race with that level of overconfidence is, I mean, I was, it was astounding. I mean, to you, watch. you win 15 times or however many times in a row and you're like one of the most powerful people, they never see it coming. They just, they think they've got their machines. They, you, the thing is, a lot of people do vote pretty much based on like, who do the Democrats endorse? Like, who does the teachers group endorse? Like, and if you're in power, like if you're a power broker, you can get all those endorsements. So every person who goes out and votes and is just like, okay, what does the pamphlet say I should vote for? And then they like click all the people like they don't know who it is. Like, he's get, he gets all those votes. So she has to win all the other votes pretty much like and she has to hope that that amount of people isn't the majority you know or or the and the people who legitimately liked him over her i mean there's i'm sure there's plenty in new york um but anyway for most my favorite parts i had many so i think one of them was um the debate moment was a uh, there's a moment where he basically tries to say like if you're criticizing this like um, then why did you have some foundation with this guy who, or like go to make a speaking conference with this guy who's like this and basically just talks about, I don't know who the person was, but some sort of like Latino, like maybe even terrorist or like some, you know, anti-Semitic, who knows what it was. Some like probably really bad guy, right? Why were you in an event with this really bad guy? Like, you know, and it's. She and she's like, that is a lie. I do not know him. I do not endorse him. I do not spend, you know, support any of his ideas. I was at the only Latino like, da -da 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 -da, like, uh, club. you know, club in this whole area. So that's why I was speaking there, not because this guy is a member or like it's his club. That's such a lie, and uh, just like dismantles the the go to political game. The go-to political game, which is like, I am going to tar you with some random person that you may or may not have actually like legitimately connected with, but I am going to, I am going to tar you. I'm going to tinge the well, put that stank on you, and fucking and ruin it. And it's such a gr stupid political move, honestly. It's like you know, you criticize her ideas or not or whatever, but like the whole guilt by association thing is such a one. It's like what conspiracy theorists do all the time, which is like totally fine. They're like, ah, oh, he was college roommates with that random person who's like now like in the, it's like or the second cousins with that. Per it's like that's not what makes real um, impacts on whether how you should judge someone. So like criticizing what she says is like. Like, totally legitimate but that was also funny because she says some very demagogue type stuff like she had there's another really my favorite one of my other favorite moments where she's talking about like what if I had a sign that said just abolish ice in like 
you know, she's like in, I don't forget where she says, I should look, it was like some part of New York. She's like, I mean, there's a sign there and like, I feel like Jackson Heights or something like that. Like, wouldn't that be gangsta? Sorry for people who know New York. I don't know all the areas. I'm very sorry for that. But uh, anyway, she's like, wouldn't that be gangsta? Like, to have that sign up there. And I was like, mm-hmm. that's hilarious. Like, that's, it's so, it's so like, that guy. but then again, like when Joe Crowley is in a debate with her and it's like, okay, so Joe, like if you call this organization ICE, like fascist, like why not abolish them? And it's like, well, that's a real problem that a lot of Democrats put themselves in where they are like sitting there and their only move is criticizing Trump and saying how shitty he is all the time and they don't actually have things that they stand for. So they get fucking knocked in the chin by people like her, who whether or not she has good ideas, there she's for things, and that was my probably my other favorite moment of the. Okay, I have two more. One of them is when she's dissing on his pamphlet. That was like such a great moment. She's like, Joe Crowley, he's got this Victoria's Secret centerfold of himself. It's like so hilarious. She's like, he's got this Victoria's Secret centerfold of himself. I Every voter it. in whatever got it what. And she's like, <laughs> I oh, just said such a different reaction. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. And she. She's like, it says, oh, I'm taking on Trump. It's like, and she just like looks at the camera like, really? And then it's like, Trump, Trump, Trump. And then she's like, how many specific policy positions? Zero. You know? And then she's like, mine tells you what my name is, what I stand for. When the election is. When the election is. And it's like, the thing is, yeah, I mean, she is a bit of a demagogue. She does... She she plays the game that people are playing now who are winning at the political game, it seems like. Like Trump is playing. She's playing she plays that game pretty good. And like you know, and so it's a, there's a critique in that too. There's a critique of every one of her policy positions which is pretty obvious. If you don't want to abolish ICE, it's like not hard to say why you don't want to abolish ICE. I don't but Joe Crowley had a real tough time with that, you know? So, I don't know. I guess it's just like right, so he just got clocked in the face over that kind of thing. And so she did really well. And the fourth part that I is one of my favorites, which actually I'm saying it's a favorite and I can't leave it off because the last scene when she's won and she's in Washington and there's the Capitol there and she talks about her dad and saying like, he's just basically was like, make me proud. And she's like, I think I finally did. And the documentary closes and you're like, wait, wait, wait. Like, I didn't even know who AOC was like when this whole thing was filmed like the story of her and i don't want to say i i am very complimentary of her obviously i am (laughs) leaving out any sort of policy thing i think about any one of her specific policies because Mm -hmm. i think the thing that is so interesting about her is that she is such a good politician and i can just see it Mm -hmm. i do it's not about the policy it's about the politician it's about the story it's about um the fact that she did clock out the number four democrat in a in a race that yeah she maybe it was there were favorable elements to her but only maybe she was the one who was seeing those so everyone taking credit for how easy it was for her to do it after the fact is forgetting that before the fact it didn't look like people could take out someone that powerful so i really think that there's a lot of credit due to her and i think that this document makes a really good point and i think that her going to washington and having it end on this i think i made him proud now it's like She's young and good at politics, and she's got to deal with so much backlash now, and she's got to uh, become a, a good at policy, or at least very intelligent to defend everything. Because, like, you know Bernie gets in debate, and someone's going to ask him about things, and whether or not his economic policies make sense, he does have an answer for everything. He can fucking handle, like, a Fox Town Hall or, like, all the debates. Like, they, he can handle it. Whether or not his policies make sense. I'm not sure she can handle it at this point, which is like what a lot of the media stuff has mm-hmm. shown. Like she's not that, but he's also like, he had for the most longest career ever, right? So, you know, he's got experience. But I think that her story, even though it ends on that, her in Washington, this like proud moment, like she finally, you know, like ma- made her dad proud or whatever. It's like, wow, this is just the beginning. Like, it's a, I thought it was really, I, I, I was, I was, uh, I thought it was really like, I was, like, I love that this documentary exists. So, anyway, yeah. I'm speaking very highly of it. I know it's controversial. I know. Sure. I'm like, 
I mean, I don't, I also think it's so silly. If you're on Twitter, you have any semi-conservatives that you follow or even just going on the news, they're overly obsessed with her in this weird way. They love to talk about her. So yeah, I'm not like on jumping it. on that bandwagon, but you're the way that you're impressed with her is just totally not my reaction. Not to hit she killed it in this life. This is not to just diss, but just as a voter, as a person reacting. Like I feel for every point that just really impresses you, I either find not impressive and maybe a little <laughs> annoying. Honestly, like that's I can't help it. Like it just doesn't impress yeah. me to present yourself that way and being really good at like Twitter politics or PR, you know, politics in that way is. Um, it just does. It just doesn't get me um, the same way. Um, and I think it's people are. I think if uh, I mean, I kind of like her, and I'd be pretty neutral. And it would be. I'd be less irritated if people weren't so obsessed with her, <laughs> including you. Just oh, it's the most impressive person I've ever seen. I mean, yeah, her confidence. I mean, seen, yeah. And she's not only bad at policy, but she's the most impressive person. And her story is the most inspiring thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, so I think that the fact that people are so obsessed with her, um, despite those things, is you know just gets a little annoying. Um, not to be a total hater. It's just my personal reaction. I'm just yeah. not quite impressed with with that in the way you are. Um, and I don't think it's super cool to just say, I, I think there's something about democratic socialism that is, you know, you are saying she's a demagogue, leaning into policies that benefit the people you're talking to. It's not the most difficult way to get people support. <laughs> I, um, yeah. So it kind of is like... I don't like cheap wins. Um, not to say that AOC is the only person who does it. It's just I think I'm just kind of more weary. And the more people are obsessed with someone for these elements, you know, everything despite having good ideas or po AKA policy isn't, um, yeah, sometimes it gets the opposite reaction. The more yeah. fucking obsessed people are with it, the more annoyed I seem to get, even though, um, you know, a part of it is probably the fact that a bunch of people uh, who are her opponents see what a threat she is, and so you're inundated with negativity around her uh, by just going on the internet, or at least the internet need, knows to show me a thousand negative things about how dumb AOC is all the time, probably because she's a threat mm -hmm. and has a really bright political career in front of her. I would um, agree with that ex a lot. Yeah, yeah I and, think that is one of the main reasons she has a lot of focus. I think it's actually interesting, too, because that was a, one of the questions that a lot of people had for her. They were like, why would we trade the like number four Democrat in Congress, who's one of the most senior people, for you, like, even if we like what you say, like, why would we trade that much power for you? And it sounds stupid now, right? Because she is, like, one of the most powerful people in the House. Because she fucking moves the media. And that's, like, a really interesting thing to think about knowing what the reality, the present reality is for her. Is that no one knew who the fuck Joe Crowley was, even when he was there at number four in the House. Because, like, realistically, the House of Representatives does have a lot of people who are, like, way worse at policy than AOC. Like, just to be real. Like... Totally. Yeah. It's like not the it's not the most impressive. I, obviously, a lot of people in the in the House of Representatives are really impressive people, but mm -hmm. um, a lot of them say really dumb things and don't actually know a lot about. I mean, being a member of Congress, you're supposed to like have a national. You're supposed to you like you should know about a lot of foreign policy. You should know about a lot of history. Mm -hmm. You should know about a lot of economics. And like obviously they don't. Like obviously so many of them don't. They think they can just like have some. A from you know a good school like tell them a bunch of things and it's like yeah it's just anyway so I'm, I'm, so I hold her to a lower standard I think I'm not holding which is her probably what yeah I if hold, not yeah. for the ridiculous media attention sh that she would be afforded that lower standard yeah. I think it's because she's been propelled to such heights so quickly yeah that the scrutiny has just really come on yeah I just think she impresses me from a um I just am always really impressed by, you know, you, you wonder when the 
lights are on. So I actually watched this kind of interesting documentary. I, f I forgot about it, about um, the price is right, you know, and about, it's like this totally screwball documentary. We can talk about it another time, but about Bob Barker, the price is right. And like Bob Barker, some random story about how he became Bob Barker on the price is right. And it's like one guy couldn't show up one day. And so Bob had to go out there with the, with the thing. And then he like made people laugh and like did a really great job. And it was like, Bob, that's what you should be doing. You know, and I'm just, I always find it really interesting when someone gets the mic and like fucking delivers. Like it's, I don't know. I mean, we see it in movies. This is a thing that movies are made of. They just made this movie, A Star is Born, right? It's like Lady Gaga, the rando, gets the fucking mic and delivers. Like obviously Lady Gaga is not a rando. But when it happens in reality, when the 28-year-old bartender gets the political shot, has a little bit of knowledge about her district, and takes out a pretty high-ranking person, I just think it's impressive. I don't have to, I'm not analyzing it on the level of does she need to be one a presidential contender? Does she need to know? national level politics economics everything like that i'm i'm definitely talking about a lower standard when i'm talking about how impressive this is mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. from a story perspective i just i was i felt i found it so compelling i found it so compelling to watch yeah there is i mean there is something very inspiring about just the establishment dynamic that Joe Crowley had going on being in office for 15 years and you know we've talked about it just this this complacency that evolved and this overconfidence that he expresses before just getting knocked out of the race by her mm -hmm. so that's an, and I like it is encouraging that she was able to beat him mm -hmm. you know despite being the establishment guy with the money and I think you you mentioned this philosophy, which is some people are saying, well, actually, if you look at the demographics, it was pretty easy for her to win. And I get what you're saying, which is before she won, it probably really wasn't obvious she was going to win. But there was a part of me who there was just fishy things as you learned about the race, just weird things like him not even living in the district that yeah. he that he was in, um, not showing up to the debate. I mean, that was bad. There, there's some other details I'm forgetting, but there was something a little fishy about the race that, not to say that it's to discount from her success, but it, I would have been personally curious to learn a little bit more about what that kind of open gate was that a AOC, to her credit, was able to see that was there. They kind of don't go into that as much, kind of probably to lean into the impressive perspective that you're talking well, about it. It's a, it's a I, bit it, of blind confidence in a, in a bet. But, yeah. well, but when it, you look at it, I felt like there were flourishes of like, oh, this race in particular had some wide open things well, like and, and how it, disconnected yeah. Joe Crowley was from these people and just demographically she can approach, you know, some ridiculous number of the voters and just be like, yeah. he's I obviously mean, not representing you and look at me like I'm I am of you. And so I would have been curious to learn about, you know, what that open window well, and, was and, and, in this election you know, that she clearly walked ben right Shapiro, through. Ben Shapiro, one of the people who obviously criticizes her a lot, um, or at least is, <laughs> in, you know, in the, in the elk of the people who do, uh, you know, he's, he's points out to, well, like, it's not all that impressive because it is a majority minority district. And she, you know, she with her Puerto Rican heritage, uh, you know, which has a lot of different ethnicities in it, uh, is kind of representative, much more representative than he was. And so a lot of people want to discount her win based on pretty much that fact, mm -hmm. like that uh, it's open because like a white guy holding on to a seat in a mi majority minority district is not like that's not actually that secure like in retrospect maybe it looks that way but there was all those people asking that question like even if we agree with you like why trade power for you like why do that like mm -hmm. if people do in a lot of districts especially these one with the long-term congressman they buy into the idea of and that was a real challenge for a lot of the other people which is they buy into the idea of we've had this senator we've had this congressman there for a long time they're ranking on certain committees they are able to make deals and advance our interests they have relationships relationships in Washington. Why trade all that for mm -hmm. you? Why trade all that for a, fr a fresh start is no good if you got no rank, if you got no relationships. So there is a lot more there to overcome the hurdle. And I think it's also like I found her um, understanding of the odds or maybe understanding a bit more like a person who understands uh, poker odds, right? You have a good hand 
and you have less chips, right, than your opponent. There's a certain point in time where it can make sense to go all in because you think like even if I even if I'm not like at 50%, right? Or even if I'm if I, you know, even if I could go all out right now. This is a moment to go all in because I can change the power dynamic on this one particular bet. So it's a it's a knowledge both of odds even if the odds aren't in your favor you can see where you have decent enough odds to where you should bet it all because if if it falls on that one in three chance, I mean, think about Trump getting elected, right? Trump had, what did he have, like a one in five chance probably of getting elected? But he fucking hit that straight with getting like winning by 20,000 votes in one state and 50,000 in another state and like 10,000 others. He hit this fucking, you know, crazy ass, bare, barely winning in a few of the Midwestern states and fucking won the election. A couple things went wrong, or you know, he, if he had won seventy thousand votes, but just in Florida, instead of the three Michigan, uh, you know, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, he wouldn't have freaking won the election at all. But he had some odds, and he and he played it, and the bet, and you know, the bet fucking worked. And sometimes that's what it is. It's not that you have to know that you're gonna win, but you have to know that if the that your odds are in a certain way and it's possible on a roll if you're like if you're playing to you know playing you might have to go all in even if you don't have like 50 per, 51 percent odds it's still like very intelligent in the way that it can be very intelligent for a poker player with um not as much chips to go all in at certain times to try to take the the power position essentially. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's that's just what I mean by the smartness and by the the knowledge plus the confidence. It was like a good better, not necessarily like a like a person who just knows they're gonna win. Mm -hmm. You know. Anyway, um, so that seems yeah. like what politics are. I mean, ugh. Ugh, that's all I can say. Oh, <laughs> kidding. I mean, it, I mean, you're leaning in on all this stuff that, I, yeah, is interesting. I just, my gut reaction is not like um, loving it like you. Like, yeah, I think it's important. I, I concede to all the things that are good. I mean, getting money out of politics sounds great. It's inspiring her win that you can get some crusty old established guy who's not really representing his district out and someone like AOC in. Um, I just think with the Democrats are so guilty of just like being really impressed with saying something like, you know, I, I, I just think like we're, it's all of these people are just going to push parts of that, you know, as a Democrat and someone who actually likes like a huge percent of what they probably believe and are advocating for, just pushing the party in, quite frankly, just in an annoying direction that makes me feel yeah, I mean, uh, alienated. It's, it's, a, true, I, it's like, a true risk. I don't like having to be like, well, aren't you impressed by, <laughs> aren't you impressed by like all, I don't know, it's just like, it's, I, I don't even want to have to. I don't even want to have to say like I don't I can't I don't even want to have to say like why it's not imp it's clear why the Democratic Party like fucking loves uh, AOC and this type of ilk even though it's been brought up that of of the people who won in the 2018 midterms a lot of more centrists one c congressional people who took a more center left position were the winners but that wasn't the story because people like AOC are more interesting partly because they're more polarizing oh, and yeah. the media just fucking loves that and there's a part of me that's frustrated by the fact that we don't just decide like hey here's where the center most important issues are going on in the Democratic Party and let's cover that it's like the media has incentive to cover some someone more on the fringe who pushes things and then that media attention becomes reality and therefore pushes uh, the Democratic Party and uh, you know forgive me for everyone who would think I'm a fucking piece of shit for wanting to be a center left person and that actually my motives are because I'm like not progressive but uh, there's a part of me who doesn't like the fact that the Democratic Party just cannot say no to the fringes ever I, and we just will <clears throat> kowtow to the fringes to a degree that's super frustrating and, and it's, it's your critique is 
is a broader is is goes into the broader critique of the polarization of the parties, right? It's very difficult to have two people in the Democratic Party, for example, to ha who have different opinions on uh, abortion, even if it's on the scale of when an abortion into the pregnancy should be allowed or not. That's really like it's almost like a no-go section for Democrats in a way. Like you can't even like pray from that position, right? Of, but it's not even clear exactly what the consensus position is. If it's like abortion in every case, if it's like every time the, the, the Republicans bring up the whole idea of like killing babies after birth, if you're just supposed to say that's a lot, like what's the, what is the position is a bit confusing sometimes, but it's also like there are a few things that are not very well discussed. Same with the abolish ICE is issue, right? Like, abolish ICE is very conflicting. Yes, people have a lot of problems with the whole family separation thing that was going on, and yes, that was, um, you know, ICE members are like involved with detaining people at the border, and uh, people were really upset with the Trump administration over this. But like to discuss the implications of the whatever that Flores settlement is and just get into all the legal jargon of whether or not you should be able to hold a child and a parent together in custody or whether you should be forced to release the child because they aren't shouldn't be held to a crime so they shouldn't be contained but then if you release it's like you know, are the Democrats going to have that conversation? Or are we just going to let people go out and say abolish ICE? Or are we going to let people have two different positions? I mean, it's not really clear. There's a little bit. And so it does reward people who pick a very extreme position. Medicare yeah. for all is a very rewarding position. You know, that it's a very, because it's it seems pretty clear. Seems pretty clear. And saying like Obamacare plus like a bit more improvement is like kind of vague. And so like, and that's the same thing on the, the Republican side. They're like, you know, build the wall for Trump was really effective, um, even though a lot of other Republicans like in the primaries were trying to say that's actually like not a great solution, even if we are like kind of don't want any more immigration, illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. And so, but he won with that, you know, polar, polarized thing. And the same, you know, there's a lot of things like Obamacare should be just repealed. You know, abortion should just be illegal in every case. You know, it's just like these positions, because of their clarity, often win out. And the, and the people in the center don't. And then the story also is less attractive. Even though a lot of the people who have wielded the most power are those center politicians. The John McCain who voted against Trump you know, on the health care bill. Or the Susan Collins, even though she did vote for Brett Kavanaugh, she she and um, uh, Lisa Murkowski, you know, senators, center, uh, you could say center-right kind of senators, um, have, were very influential. They're very influential because they aren't necessarily bought just by the party line because they are center but then they got to defend their seat every time they don't just win the seat and then hold it for forever mm -hmm. so it's really important to have these center politicians because if you have a center democrat that's someone who the republicans actually might try to convince you know to get over and if you have a center right republican it's something who the democrats might try to convince to defect and that's like a really nice thing to have that's what we want in politics is people who actually might listen to the other side but when you're just for your team you don't actually like people who might defect to the other side it like is hurtful for the team so the team has a lot of incentive to actually prop up people on the side as opposed to the people who are actually kind of gonna do a f maybe more effective governing or may I mean I don't know it's you're on one side you really like that John McCain like said you know, I don't think this thing we're going to do by repealing Obamacare is a good deal. You know, you, you might like that. But if you're on the other side, you might like that Joe Manchin, you know, Democrat, voted for Brett Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court. Because, you know, this is, you know, for whatever reason he decided that was a good decision, you know. And so, you know, you might like a center Anyway, you might like that they exist, but you don't like existing if they're on your side. So it's a real conflicting scenario, and it does it does ultimately make it very hard to be a center politician in this country because of those two reasons. You can't really make a clear point, and uh, your own side might 
like resent you a bit because you might deflect because someone else might convince you of something. Oh, forbidden. That's forbidden. No one can ever convince you that their side in an issue is okay. That's like not okay. So it's like a real tough thing that's happening with politics. Yeah, I, I think that it kind of gets to, you know, what, and I'm not harshly like I understand why you're impressed I think this is a totally valid reaction I think one of the reasons why I kind of have this more of a reflex and feel differently and not as impressed is you know you describe admitted like in some ways she's a bit of a demagogue and yeah just with these democratic socialist positions it, there, there's something about it that feels a little too easy especially because if, if any of them are challenged you can take a kind of a moral grandstanding position position on each of them um, instead of engaging with nuance or some policy debate you can kind of be like well, you know, if someone challenges Medicare for all, or in immigration, for example, even though it might be better to have a little bit more policy discussion on what comprehensive immigration reform would be, just wins a little bit better to be the one on the side of the people who are suffering the most. And that's the focus. I mean, Medicare for all, Green New Deal. It's just like any one of them, um, it's just there's something that's a little too easy because the opponents of these, or at least to not go straw man and try to engage with an intelligent opponent of any of, of these stances, is not, hey, I am against people getting medical care, or I am pro-separating kids from their parents, or I don't give a shit about the environment. Like, you know, to, that isn't the perspective that people who have a differing opinion, especially the center people in the Democratic Party have. You know, they are more focused with, I love the values that you're coming from, the, the perspective you're coming from. I'm also being pragmatic and wanting to get things done. And I'm also trying to factor in the unforeseen negative consequences of what you're trying to push forward. Yeah. But and, and but if you're a democratic socialist, like Bernie's positions or AOC's positions are a little bit easy to hold in a way because they don't fully have to answer those questions or they can answer the question by it's as simple as taxing one, two, three and not having to get into the complications of how some of those taxes would get pushed through, what the negative consequences are, and it's yeah. much more diffuse yeah. what those counterarguments are. So that is why it's just a little less impressive to me someone who holds all these positions and pushes them forward because there's kind of an – it's like – an easy way to win yes. votes and support. And it, there's an interesting poll I think people say is like, do you support Medicare for all? You like, they ran a poll on that. And then they're like, do you support Medicare for all if it means taxing A, B, and C? And then the poll numbers are like wildly different. Yeah. Um, and it's just, that's simply put the reason why I have more of a gag reflex because I feel like, oh, I'm, I don't want to be impressed by this because I see it as a little bit easy in a way. Yeah. Uh, so on, yeah, on the poll issue, yeah, it's, it's true. It's like people do like things in vacuums and that's why demagoguery can work because you don't have to think about the specifics. I often think though that what's more frustrating, I don't really mind so much that people have... Like, I obviously don't mind that anyone has any really opinion or does anything with their life, but, um, and especially like, they're, like I want to listen. I think it's kind of fascinating to hear, like, in a lot of times, that's what we read, watching a lot of documentaries. We're watching a lot of ridiculous versions of the human experience out there. And that's what makes them so fascinating. It's real. It's like a lot of things, and a lot of what makes it really interesting is you don't get it. It's like way far from like how your brain works or whatever. So we're obviously like like a lot of the interesting things. I think maybe more of a frustrating thing is um, oftentimes people are very polarized. They think they know, and the reason that you don't agree with them is because you don't know. Like it's very much like the same critique I felt like was um, you know you were getting in like a Catholic school. You know where it's like the reason that you don't um, you know agree with everything I say is because you just haven't learned enough about Jesus. And you're like <laughs> um, 
there could be other reasons. Has that crossed your mind? Like, it's not always, it's so easy to believe that the people who don't agree with you are just ignorant. That's, but it's too easy. If you know a lot, if you know a lot about history, economics, foreign, the way that other countries and cultures work, to assume then that everyone who disagrees with you is just ignorant, or if you, or to assume that even very smart people who disagree with you are simply ignorant or evil, is just uh, just not always true. Like they could have legitimately different opinions about the world than you, but why Medicare for all, for example, is not a great policy or why abolishing ICE is not or why, uh, you know, the Green New Deal is not, uh, you know, the, something that people should vote for. All those things to just believe that anyone who wouldn't support you is either ignorant or evil, as you're saying, is a is too easy of an answer because it's pretty clear that when you actually get into it there are some pretty uh, good challenges that people are going to come at you with and they are based in history economics foreign policy and anything that people believe for example about foreign policy foreign policy is really complicated right like whether or not you should be in a foreign country or out you know i saw an interview with uh, tulsi gabbard recently trying to argue figure out about how she can say that she's anti-regime change but also very uh like um, what she called herself, like a hawk on terrorism, right? It's a bit of a complicated position because the average mm -hmm. person doesn't really understand how you can be a hawk on terrorism, but not like for all the basically wars like against Saddam Hussein and, you know, uh, all this. It, it, it doesn't make much sense, maybe. But it's obviously very complicated territory. And people can have legitimate disagreements about strategy, tactical, thinking about history of certain regions, thinking about uh, whether or not w what your enemy is motivated by, that's the mistake that people often make. So thinking that in domestic politics is, is a mistake, obviously. When you're sitting there going, does a terrorist do it because of U.S. foreign policy or does a terrorist do it because that's what they read in a book? You know, the debate that people in America are having about what is in the mind of a terrorist, what is truly motivating them, is it is. <laughs> It's a tough debate because it's really hard to figure out what the hell is in someone's mind. I mean, they can tell you out of their lips, but they might lie, you know. And so we th we make we all make this mistakes as humans. We try to pretend like we know what is in someone else's mind. It's a very dangerous game, you know. Terrorist tells you they did. You know, Osama bin Laden tells you he did 9/11 because of U.S. intervention and whatever. Yeah, you could possibly believe him, but he also killed 3,000 people. He might be lying. If he tells you he did it because of a book, hey, you might believe him, but he also might be lying. You might just want power, you know. So it's hard to, or it might be a sectarian, uh, uh, you know, issue that's been going on for thousands of years. Or the reason to not go into Afghanistan, you could look back at Russia and maybe Napoleon. Like you can, if you know more, if you know a lot, your your opinions about why to disagree with someone can become very complex, not very easy to understand. So it's really interesting to actually just learn why people disagree, as opposed to kind of like assuming what's in their brain. Because oftentimes, especially very smart people have really interesting reasons for why they're disagreeing and there's a lot of knowledge to be had in the world. It's very obvious there's a lot of knowledge to be had. So these simple answers, these demagogic like answers, they're very savvy politically and obviously I think it's a it's a total skill. Uh, that's like one of the main compliments I have of her. She's very skilled from almost nowhere. Like I kind of she has talent, you know. Some people don't really think talent's a thing. She has talent. Hmm. Um, I think that she, and I don't hold her to the standard that she needs to know everything, but I do know there are people out there like Ben Shapiro who are fucking really, like, know so much. It's impressive. Like, they've read more books than, you know, a hundred other people combined. Um, and so they're really impressive people. And they, you would think they could have, like, a, maybe a real opinion on every single freaking issue that a senator or a congressperson could have and maybe could actually debate her and whip, wipe the floor with her because they know a hundred times more knowledge than her. But um, that's also not the only thing that impacts whether or not you would be a good uh, politician.
for example. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anyway, I just think she has some skills. I was really impressed by it. I thought it was inspiring to watch just as a person, you know, even if you are on the complete other side of the aisle, I thought it was inspiring. And I just want to make one other point that I think is interesting about this is that um, when Sarah Palin was nominated for vice president, someone we've talked about, John McCain, who I think if you're like a Democrat and you watched him in the last years of your life, like he became kind of like a little bit of a hero for standing up to Trump and also like was is one of the most kind of horrific things that Trump did in his um, getting up to like um, being the nominee of the Republican Party is dissing on John McCain for getting captured. It was like it's so gross and such a bad joke. It was it's a it's a bit galling that anyone would even think that was funny or something to say or what group of people would react nicely to that. It's it's mm -hmm. weird to like even see that happening. So it's really he has a really interesting thing, but he made obviously a very huge mistake in picking Sarah Palin. And when Sarah Palin was picked in, as the running mate, mm -hmm. I mean, I do not think just to be clear that any person without a, without a certain threshold of knowledge should be president. President is a lot different than a member of the House of Representatives. Okay, and picking a vice president is is backup president, right? Is heart attack, cancer, shot president, right? And so it's a really important to have someone who's like not just like a like gonna excite the crowd as vice president. It says fucking you're you, the guy you picked. He's out. For whatever reason, and you need someone to man the ship, even if you're in a war, or even if mm -hmm. you're in like whatever is going on. Like you need someone really capable, already 100% there as vice president. That's at least what I think is important in a vice president. And so, when she was picked, I'm not into the whole like n the person at that level cannot um, have the full education, you know, for a house. Of, and so I think that obviously if mm. AOC wants mm -hmm, to be president, mm -hmm. I think there is a, a bit of a learning curve that has been, and, and I don't think she, and I don't think she necessarily has to change any positions. Like she could have, Bern, she has very similar positions to Bernie, but I do think that Bernie probably has a bit more experience. I'm not sure how much real experience he has in like foreign policy or business or what all these other things, but realistically, like at least more working knowledge. And I think she's young too. She's only 28. I mean, that's one of the reasons why they made it. So you had to be 35 because it is, it takes a fucking long time, even if you are really smart to learn as much and to have as much life experience, like to see a couple economic cycles you know even us we've only seen like one crash really we weren't around during the 1999 crash and we've only seen like one real boom you know like the last maybe 10 years you know we haven't even seen that much to be real about it like to think that you know 35 is pretty young pretty young to know as much as it would take to be president and it's one of the reasons why it's like kind of a good rule that like AOC can't run right now because you know to, to be fair she doesn't need to have that much experience to be in the house but to be president you really do and there's plenty of people who are 80 who don't know enough to be president right <laughs> obviously but um, <laughs> there's like but you know it's it's a I think she um, I don't know if her position will change at all I don't I'm not saying they should but I think that um, I'm holding her to a a lower standard and if she mm -hmm. was coming in for someone's VP pick I would be much more concerned about um, whether or not she had a full handle and I don't think it's a it's a high standard it's a high standard and I don't think every president has met that standard but you know that's so it's a I'm just it's a different thing so mm -hmm. just to put it in context because I think they are kind of similar characters very exciting came out of nowhere in a way really can rile up the base became very powerful very quick I mean because Sarah Palin was kind of like the Tea Party for a while, you know? Tea Party came out of Obama getting elected. She was the biggest figure of that time. Yes. yes. Aside from Glenn Beck. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and um, similarly, I was, I mean, Sarah Palin was on another level. But yeah, that was like a total eye roll for me. When those type of people are propped up, it's like, what do you see? And the, I mean, with, they're totally different, but both equally. Of course, policy-wise, they're totally different. But um, And AOC does not seem as like, I don't know if I read. You know, it's like she's not at that kind of comedic level, but also. So okay. she's definitely way smarter and more impressive. I mean, yeah, leaps and bounds. But I mean, I guess it's the excitement. But Sarah Palin had a like lot that. of savvy. Though. She was she was actually she was good at finding the little jugular and sticking her finger in. She had a lot of that Trump talent for like figuring out where the vein was and putting her finger on it. But <laughs> but um, yeah, talented maybe in the politics, but not very worrisome. 
as president. Which yeah, is a yeah. lot of the reason why people worry about Trump. Because they're not sure he could... They're not sure he really gets it. People have been arguing over whether or not he's the mad genius or just the mad king, you know? <laughs> it's a big fucking difference. Yeah, it's and interesting, so. you know, because it, 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 I totally get what you're seeing when saying when you say both of them have talent um and but there's just this this part of me that's wondering like is i don't know if that's the talent that i really like and respond to yeah as someone who's going to be a politician and it's and I, it, it gets i guess that's where the annoyance is when the energy and how many people will just fucking love that and are won over by whatever you know that type of talent um, yeah because it's not always what i'm looking for Hey everyone, welcome back to Dirk Island. This segment is worth watching. We are talking about Knock Down the House, the documentary on Netflix about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her uh, primary election win over Joe Crowley and also it was a little bit about three other people who didn't win. But um, anyway, what would you think, Alec? Worth watching? Worth people's time? I'm going to give it a solid six. Maybe worth watching. Listen, if you're just in America and on social media or watch cable news in the next couple of years, you're probably going to have AOC shoved down your throat anyway. So you don't necessarily need to go out of your way to watch this documentary. It's interesting as someone who's already heard about her a ton and gave me some context of, you know, who Justice Democrats were, who this organization that brought this fresh class of Congress people in. There, there's some good moments, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, compared to a lot of other people, I just wasn't as impressed. Okay, so <laughs> knowing that you're going with the six, uh, so I was conflicted on this. My actual thing is I would say it's a nine. Definitely worth watching. And obviously this is one that we had a very different reactions to. Um, and my review, 9 is a super high rating for us. Uh, it is beyond just if you like documentaries, you might like watching this. And perhaps you're someone who would know if you would like watching this because maybe it's a story that's going to resonate with you if you already you know, have a tinge of maybe you should watch this, I would say definitely worth watching. But also maybe for some people who uh, don't even like AOC, like this might be worth watching for them too. And that's why I say it's even beyond for the people who just are into documentaries. I'm conflicted about this. I don't think that it's, this review also is, it's never about whether or not this documentary is good or bad on a, is it a good documentary? category. This is whether or not it's worth your time, whether or not it's potentially going to do something for you, give you another perspective in life, another tool in the tool set. I think that the most impressive thing to watch about this is you're just like, can't stand that I am like... <laughs> no, no, I'm, lo I'm, loving the di I'm loving the difference of opinion. Yeah, the, uh, the thing that I thought was so incredible about this is that I don't... When I saw her come out on to the stage and ask certain questions by there was a specific thing uh interview with her about what she thought about middle eastern policy and she like flubbed it didn't know what she was doing i never i had i don't know uh seeing her that made me particularly impressed i knew she was powerful i knew people fucking obsess over her they're, it seems like they're threatened a bit but people are like she creates this media circus and I haven't seen anything that she's said that's been super impressive. So when I saw this, this was like a lot of the story before I even heard of her. It's the story of her winning this primary defeat over this Democrat who was number four, possibly going to be the next Speaker of the House, You know, number four power seniority, been there for a long time, huge power broker, and she beats him. And what I think is so impactful about this is that, I mean, obviously I think it is important for people – you know, politics for me is a bit of a form of entertainment. Like, I, I pay attention to politics as much as a lot of people pay attention to football or baseball or whatever. And I would, I, I think it's pretty good if people were to spend more time thinking about politics. I think it's important, even if they come to a position that I wouldn't necessarily agree with. Um, so I like that this might inspire people to uh, think more about politics, perhaps even be care about politics, get involved, um, or just whatever it does for them, just just 
I like that it exists as a documentary for that purpose. I think that there are people that might see this documentary and actually might be inspired to um, do something positive for our country through politics. There are also people who might just be like, yeah, there's a bit of a demagogue feeling to it, and that's a lot of how she wins. And she's got a, she's got a real skill that is demonstrated through this. She's got a talent. When she, there's a scene where she's talking about her, um, you know, whether or not she can win, and whether or not there's a lot of these scenes actually where she's talking about whether or not the Democrats in New York, you know, understand because everyone basically thought she couldn't win until it was too late, mm -hmm. and. And she's saying basically like they don't get it. They don't. They're just saying like, oh, we're not going to deal with Trump. They don't give any specific policy positions. Then she comes out there with some of her policy positions, which have been widely criticized now for being kind of ridiculous or not fully knowing or whatever. Um, and so there's a lot of legitimate critiques, but she has skill when it comes to the debates. When she gets up and she gets the mic, she can talk. She's like not nervous in a way that's almost. Uh, it seems like she came, she has skills that you don't know where she got them from. And um, I think it tells a really interesting story about her uh, overcoming a, a, true, a challenge and winning in this kind of small race, but winning, but in a way that um, was very impressive to me, not because of like the things she said or because like being, you know, saying things like abolish ice is like the most whatever but the things more impressive like should we have gone into Iraq or not and her just being like I think it was stupid why did anyone do it you know like I thought she had skills I thought she had skills and she had confidence and the confidence to me was very impressive not just because she was faking the confidence but because I think she actually had that combination of the skills that it took and even though she was a 28 year old bartender like actually had the public speaking skills to take on this guy who ha had the seat to stand up for what she believed in now maybe her beliefs are not uh, like so you know I don't think she won only because of she had ridiculous policies that can never come into place I think that she won because she is a presence she has lots of um, she has a great presence in the in her ability to actually answer a question directly even if she says something that might be not that smart economically or historically or stupid or whatever foreign policy wise I think she has a lot of skill and I think it would be nice I think it's just undeniable and I um, I didn't know that before watching that and I think also there's uh, you know I was a bit moved just because I thought that she um, she had a goal she had a good strategy she had a lot of confidence that confidence seemed to me to um, add something to my worldview about how people actually do what she did mm -hmm. and it wasn't just the story that you might hear otherwise that is she won as a minority in a majority minority district I think there's more to this story there I think it was very impressive and that's why I think it is definitely worth watching <laughs> Uh, well, I felt like that was a good characterization of why I've, uh, you know, had enough of this already before <laughs> I even saw the documentary. No, it was, um, it was solid. Um, I just, you know, obviously had a it's certainly different not, yeah. reaction than that. Um, not, but a well-made, interesting backstory, just not essential viewing, um, from my perspective. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I also thought, I also thought you that you can't help but get, you know, what? uh, you can't help but get a, a, a lot about it. AOC, whether you want it or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I thought she was, uh, or I, I think also I always give something better if I think I'm going to feel a way and then I feel the opposite way. And I think I had the, I don't think this is probably going to be that good. And then I, I, I felt like it was like a, a huge surprise to me. And I really like when a mm. movie does that. And maybe that's just a, a bad me setting my expectations. But um, I thought it, I thought it has a place and I, and I think I might think about this documentary many times more, which is for how many we watch. Uh, 
you know, not all of them really get that place, and that's why I'm, I really felt like I had to push this up to a nine, which is a extremely high score on mm. our, our worth watching scale. Yeah, I mean, I certainly, I've and already you might, you might, yeah, you might brought this up um, to people because of the relevance of AOC um, and being on Netflix and well made documentary. I mean, I, I, I feel I will talk about this documentary again, um, but I had that different reaction where I thought, you know, went in not knowing if it would do so much for me and I just don't felt feel like it added some incredible piece to the AOC story or even the you know that those 2018 midterm elections um, I'm in a bubble <laughs> the bubble of the bubble yeah the bubble of like Angeles. I'm in a bubble of think, Los Angeles and the entertainment industry the where I'm thinking spectrum. I'll get so much hate for saying anything but how much I love this documentary in AOC. Even the, and it was good. But on um, the internet but you're um, probably in the majority. Yeah, people are gonna so you know, <laughs> fair enough. Anyway, um okay, so thanks very much for watching. Uh, if you want to keep up with us, please subscribe um, on YouTube or you can also listen to the podcasts which are available on Apple Podcasts. Thanks very much. <laughs>